Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Angles and Attitudes. On this one, I hope you brought your appetite. John, how you doing? All right, we're going to have a good one tonight, and I am hungry. There you go. Well, I'm going to bet that you're going to be even hungrier, because today we are real happy to be joined for taking time out of his busy schedule by the food guy, Steve Delinsky. Steve, thanks for joining us, and welcome to the podcast. It is so great to be here, gentlemen. Nice to be with you. I appreciate it. Hey, you got us jealous already. Look like you're sitting outside somewhere enjoying the nice weather, right? Which everybody in Chicago probably is right now wanting to get out and, <laughs> and eat outside and everything tastes better outside, right? Without a doubt. Everything tastes better al fresco. And I'm sitting on my deck here in West Town. Uh, we've had 45 of 47 cloudy, rainy days. So I went for a bike ride already today. I just biked down to um, Hyde Park and back and um, having a little vermouth uh, cocktail here and uh, life is good. Drink. Life is good. All right. So everybody, our, our questions are, first of all, why don't you weigh 300 pounds? Um, but, and secondly, the envy of, tell us a little bit around the story, um, Minnesota kid that becomes food guy and uh, has a, taken over a, a big part of that element of the Chicago media over the past 20 years? Yeah, well, the, the weight question is a good question because I get that a lot. Um, I'm really good about portion control. I am one of those people who, if presented with a, a plate of, you know, like a burger and a plate of fries, I'll take a couple of fries and I'm done. I don't need to eat the whole thing. I never clean my plate unless it's Korean food, uh, but I'm really good about just portion control and uh, pacing myself, not snacking a lot. I eat, you know, three meals a day and exercise. When I mean, you've got to exercise, it's always that sort of equi equilibrium. If I have a day of like heavy eating, I'll make sure that the next day I'm exercising quite a bit. And I do this, it's over here in the West Loop called Core Power Yoga. And they do a class called Yoga Sculpt. And it's a, like a hot room with weights and yoga. And I got the idea, Rick Bayless, I know I always did yoga. I mean, like I think it's every day. Mm -hmm. And he's in his 60s. He looks amazing. And so I started doing yoga and then I did this class. So I, I definitely exercise a couple of times a week. Um, and then in terms of, you know, just what I've been doing, I, you're right. It's a weird beat. I mean, the fact that I get paid to eat for a living. <laughs> um, Steve, I, I just got to ask you real quick. I mean, it, it's got to be kind of hard not to overindulge, especially if it's something that you really like. I mean, it, do you, do you well, kind of like, yeah, like oh. if it's, if it's the middle of July and I'm sitting on the, the patio at Johnny's in Elmwood Park and I haven't eaten all day and I've got a beef sweet hot juicy side of fries, large lemon ice, no lid. Yeah, it's hard not to eat the whole thing. I probably will polish that off. Um, I have very few things that I can polish off and I feel like, okay, I can treat myself. I'm not like, you know, I don't have to punish myself, but I'm really disciplined. I mean, that is really like the secret because I know that it's so easy to, to balloon and just to eat everything. And I get, you know, I go to a restaurant and, you know, a quarter of the time, somebody is like sending out an extra plate for me or try this, or here's an extra dessert, you know, and I want to be polite and I'll have a couple of bites, but I, um, no, I, I'm really disciplined. You, you have to be disciplined. Otherwise, like I say, if you eat a whole thing of French fries, that's trouble. No, you bring up a point. Um, you're talking about Johnny's. We grew up uh, Harlem and Montrose and John's, uh, Family Travel Agency is uh, on Belmont, just west of Harlem. So that's right in that area. So it's interesting. You had the Chicago cadence for what you ordered. That if you oh, went to another yeah. town, right, you couldn't like because you can go to you can go to Johnny's or you can go to Jay's over there on uh, Montrose and Nagel. And if you're not ready when they come to take your order, right, you get bumped to the back of the line. It is very much the soup Nazi situation. Yeah, they wouldn't. I mean, Johnny's they're not going to bump you to the end of the line, but. It's sort of like saving face. And I love taking out of towners. In fact, a good friend of mine who's a well-known food writer in Italy wanted to go there because she said, what is this uh, Italian beef that you have in this city? I don't you have <laughs> Italian beef in uh, Rome. So I took her for an Italian beef and you know, it's like uh, two beef, sweet out, juicy, uh, you know, uh, give me a spoon of juice and a, and a baptized the other one and uh, you know, two small ice, uh, no lid. And I just, I love the cadence. I love ordering it like that. I love showing people what we, you know, a tradition in Chicago that goes back, you know, 60, 70 years. And the funny thing was the rest of the day, she kept saying, 
she's sniffing her hands like i love the smell of garlic and oregano <laughs> on my hand because it's like it's so everywhere yeah. right no yeah. that was a tradition with my mother-in-law you know god rest her soul but she'd go down north avenue and buy the five gallon bucket of beef and you could walk into the house and you just knew it or you know you just open the windows would be open and the wind would be blowing and you're like it's going to be a good day and, and you know, the, 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 the thing that separates the pros from the amateurs is how thin they slice it. I find a lot of places don't slice thin enough. Mm -hmm. I mean, the jus is, you know, the question of seasoning, of course, but I, I find that it's a lot of, there's a lot of tough beef out there. And the ones that really slice the paper thin are the ones I tend to like, like Bobo's on Irving or Johnny's or original Mr. Beef. Yeah, they got it down to a science, Steve. You are correct. I think that gives for a better thing in the, right in that French bread. Also consistency. I mean, I've been going to Johnny's for uh, 20 years. I mean, the fact that it's, it tastes the same, I know exactly what it'll taste like. You know, we always had to deal with our kids who are now in their 20s and they left the nest. But when they were little, we used to go to Kitty Land, you know, west of there. North and the, the deal was you cannot eat or drink at Kitty Land because that's garbage. We're going to stop at Johnny's on the way there or on the way back. That was the deal. And it tastes the same as it, it did 20 years ago. And or you go down River Road and you go to Gene and Jude's for a hot dog. And if the hot dog doesn't crack when you bite into it with the fries on top, <laughs> I, that was right. I, People don't understand. I'm less enamored. I'm less enamored with Gene and Jude's. I know I'm in the minority, but I, when I talk to people like Donnie Medea from One Off Hospitality and you know, Beck, who grew up out there, and he's a big fan of Alpine Subs and Gene and Jude's, you can't argue with those people. It's like arguing with somebody from Homewood or Flossmore who thinks Aurelio's is the greatest pizza in the world. I get it, but I, I don't think Gene and Jude's is the greatest. My problem with that hot dog is the ratio. You know, I'm all about optimal bite ratio, OBR, when I eat a pizza. And I feel like a size 10 hot dog over there is like a meat pencil. And no matter what you put on it, it's gonna be overwhelmed by the bun and the, and the condiments. And I like a size six or a size eight. So there, so, uh, so there we learned something right away in terms of the percentages, which which is interesting because obviously we all love pizza and, and you know your book about the best pizza and you sit and you talk with people about it and, and for non-professionals, if you will, to say, well, why did you like this more than you like the other one? Is as you said, everything kind of worked in concert and not one particular element, right? Outpaces whatever else you're doing. I've always been a fan of balance, like the Thai food principle, you know, Thai food should not be spicy, like blow your head off. It should be sweet, sour, salty, and a little spicy. And I feel that way about just food in general. I want balance. I don't want to have a mouthful of cheese or a mouthful of dough when eating a pizza. I want to have what I call, again, the OBR, often white ratio, uh, cross cheese sauce topping every bite, cross cheese sauce topping. Same thing with a hot dog. If you get a size four hot dog, which is four to a pound, that's a quarter pounder, it's too much. Yeah. When you put the seven uh, condiments on there, mm -hmm. it's overwhelming. You can't fit it in your mouth. Yeah. But a size 10 is the opposite. A size 10 is too small. You want a size six, you know, six to a pound. That's a perfect size when you're putting on, you know, sport peppers and pickle spear and tomatoes and onions and you know, the whole thing. So the garden on a bun, I think it works with a six or an eight as opposed to a 10. So I'm all about the balance. I really approach it, you know, <laughs> I mean, maybe a little too scientifically sometimes, but I really feel like you know, what is it that people remember about a good eating experience is the balance. I don't want to eat a hamburger that I can't fit in my mouth. You know, I don't want to have to bite it three times just to get one side of it. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to bite it, you know, with two hands. And I don't want it so hard yeah. for people. Well, the, the, take us through the process. Everybody goes, oh, it must've been easy. You just go to eat 27 different pizzas. You write down a few notes and then you're done. Or was Not it that easy? easy? Um, not easy at all. Um, in fact, I had a lot of friends who were like, they heard that I was doing this pizza crawl and they all said, oh, you know, sign me up. I love pizza. Take me with you. So I said, OK, you know, here we go. We're going to, you know, I said, we're going to attack Chicagoland like Sherman moving through the south. You know, so we're going to do Elmhurst and Glen Ellen and Naperville and Wheaton. And, you know, then we're going to come back and we're going to go northwest side. And so every day is four or five places. You know, now we're not eating a whole pizza, obviously. Mm -hmm. We're having sure. a couple of bites usually a bite from the tip, bite from the heel, you can kind of tell if it's worth eating more. Um, and you can kind of look at the pizza and see if they've cooked it properly, but typically two bites a minimum. But I mean, four or five places in a day would, would be typical. And so after, the, after a day, you know, of course my friends are eating a whole slice because they're amateurs. 
And by the end of the day, they're like, you know, they got the cheese sweats and they don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> and uh, it separates the men from the boys pretty quickly. So, and it's, think about doing that for like three months, you know, doing four days on, three days off. Because um, I really took it seriously. I really wanted to treat it as a scientific method as much as I could. Mm -hmm. And so the first round, when I first did this four or five years ago, was 186 places to get to 101 that I could recommend wholeheartedly. So there were about 85 that, that didn't make the cut. And then for this second book, The Ultimate Chicago Pizza Guide, uh, during the pandemic, I went to another 30, 35 places. So it really was a slog. It was not fun. And I took probably a month off from eating pizza when I was done. Steve, I want to ask you, because I've done, been with a lot of these Italian guys in this area from Elmwood Park all the way to Des Plaines, all the way to Elmer's. These guys have become connoisseurs, meaning they're going to school. They're uh, they're on Pizza uh, Nation for the Olympics and everything. So I ran into a lot of them. What do you base it on? Let's say, here's the question. What do you base it on that, let's say, the Aurelio's from maybe uh, another pizzeria in the city? Because there's a lot of them by me where I've ranked it's, them number one and I'll put them up against it, anybody. It, a lot of it is the, it, mostly the crust. I mean, think about it. The crust is the basis of every bite you're going to have in the pizza. So the crust has to be, you know, whether it's a three-day fermented artisan dough that tastes like a ciabatta or a baguette or an overnight ferment or a six-day ferment like at Pat's where they're doing, you know, tavern style, thin, cracker thin, crispy. Um, but I'm looking at the crust, you know, is it crisp? Is it firm? Is it cooked properly? Is it cooked? Is it done? You know, sometimes a lot of times they're underdone. A lot of times the top is underdone. And that's why a lot of places like you know, back in the day at Villanova or at Phil's in Oakland or Phil's in Bridgeport, they'd say, oh, make sure you order it well done. Like, I'm not ordering steak, you know, just I'm ordering a pizza <laughs> and the pizzaiolo should know how to make a pizza. I don't have to give them well done instructions, right? So you're looking at how the pizza, is it cooked doneness? You know, when I look under a pizza called the undercarriage, when I look underneath the pizza, I want to see three to four shades of brown. I want to see tan dark brown, deep brown, a little char. Uh, you shouldn't just see sort of a blonde or sort of one color undercarriage. That to me says, you know, they've moved it on the, they've moved it around on the stone properly. They've baked it evenly. Um, and then again, the ratio, back to the ratio question. Is it every bite, are you getting that crust cheese sauce topping? And I find, man, a lot of places are just lazy. They put too much cheese on, they're not weighing the cheese, it's inconsistent. They're undercooking it. Um, rarely are they overcooking it. And I just, you know, you see cheese on top, it's not fully melted and that doesn't have a little mottling and the browning and the bubbling. Like, mm. what are you doing? I mean, you can see the pizza when it comes out of the oven, it's not done. So crust quality and doneness and ratio. Well, that's just, just that consumption. Those are those people that get three beers in them or whatever, and you're just shoveling it in and you're not, like you said, enjoying and savoring all of what it should have to offer versus maybe what it does. And it just becomes more of a fast food than anything else. You get to a point in this business where you can just look at it and go, yeah, I'm probably not gonna like that. I mean, I, like you look at like a home run in from the mothership on 31st street and they've been making that pizza for 75 years. I mean, they know what they're doing over there. And I like how they crimp the edge like they do at Barnaby's up on the North shore. And it's just, it's consistent every time. And I feel sorry for the people who only eat home run in frozen as good as it is. It's fine. But man, going to the mothership on 31st and having it you know, out of the oven there, it's a different story. You're definitely losing something by not going there. Exactly. Oh, uh, there's those right. Yeah. And then you've got the, uh, they used to do, you do the uh, buffet at lunchtime and you'd have the little red card or the green card that stop them or bring them back and they would bring it out for you. Okay. So word of the wise, um, as a professional, I don't do a lot of buffets. Um, I just theme it was tables, home running you know, pizza. It was just it was home running pizza. Yeah, it's just never going to be good because it's been sitting under lights or on a steam table, right? It's just the quality is deteriorating as it's sitting there, and it could be a Chinese buffet, an Indian buffet, a uh, Greek town has lots of steam table stuff. It's just it never, never good. No. Well, obviously the uh, COVID, which obviously it plays a, it played a significant role in the restaurant industry over the past 24 plus months also was another element that's pretty much moved the the whole buffet issue as well can you if if you can talk a little bit about the process or or the apparent rebound of how the restaurant industry has had to 
pivot, right? That's everybody's favorite word now. You got to pivot in order to find yourself and what your niche is now going forward. So a big problem for a lot of restaurants, not just food costs have been skyrocketing. Mm -hmm. They cannot raise all of their prices uniformly because this week eggs or cheese is, you know, twice as much as it was a month ago. But the other problem is labor. You know, you really are having a hard time finding people in every position. Um, and they're offering people 20, 22 bucks an hour to wash dishes. But you're finding a lot of people doing it themselves. You know, the owners and managers, they're on the floor, they're in the back. Um, they're not, there's, there's not a lot of extra staff these days. That's been a big pivot. The other thing is they're finding out ways to sort of uh, pare down their menus so they don't need as much prep time. Because, you know, prepping, paying somebody 25 bucks an hour to come in and prep vegetables uh, for dinner service is expensive. And um, I think that's been one of the big things. The other odd thing that's happening in Chicago is this sort of this um, weird separation between the sort of high end tasting menus, really rare air. I've never seen this many tasting menus for $250, $280 plus per person, plus wine, plus tax, plus tip. Um, Esme, Ever, uh, Claudia, the Umbacase Room. Uh, I mean, there are so many places doing these tasting menus now. And then on the flip side of that, places in these ghost kitchens, like in Humboldt Park and Avondale, South Loop, uh, there are all these ghost kitchens where there's nine or 10 or 12 businesses in this building. And they've got a little, you know, 12 by 14 kitchen. And uh, you can order it for pickup or delivery. Uh, it's not really a restaurant per se. But that has also been this weird pivot in that people can open a business and not need to have a brick and mortar and, and pay a landlord a lot of money uh, because you know they just don't know what their monthly nuts going to be like. So um, that's been the big, big pivot. I think, you know, like the Tribune just reviewed a place, Lisa Chu reviewed a place uh, called Three Little Pigs and it's in the Humboldt Park ghost kitchen. There's nowhere to sit. I mean, it's all takeout and delivery only, but she gave it a lot of ink in the Tribune as a full-blown review. Hmm. Steve, you saw with uh, Steve and Mark, you saw where during the COVID, um, uh, the carryout, if you had that good niche in the carryout, whether it be a pizza place or just a good carryout, really thrived during COVID. Are you in agreement? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, that's part of the reason I wrote the second book was because I saw all these places shifting to pizza, adding pizza, like Table Donkey and Stick is a great restaurant in Logan Square, but they added an amazing Roman uh, sort of Sicilian pizza to their menu every day and now it used to be a special and a lot of places kept adding pizza because you know hey it's affordable it's approachable it's inexpensive 30 bucks feeds a family of four and uh it just hits all the boxes right it touches all the things and you know if you're a meat lover if you're vegetarian you could go gluten-free you could go vegan sometimes it just sort of i think it checks all the boxes and so a lot of people shifted not just pizzerias but people who were like oreo two-star michelin tasting menu restaurant in, in River West, they closed during COVID. The partners, business partners had a place in Ukrainian village called the Bite Cafe, which they could not operate. So they collaborated with the chef from Oriole and they changed the name of Bite Cafe to Pizza Friendly Pizza. And um, I was kind of the matchmaker between the chef and this guy in Las Vegas, who's the major domo of Sicilian pizza. And they got together and now there's an amazing Sicilian pizza in Ukrainian village on Western Avenue. Oh, 1039 North and pizza friendly pizza makes amazing Sicilian pizza. There's never been a pizza like it in Chicago, different from the bakery style pizzas you see at D'Amato's and Sicilia Bakery. And I think that's a great little happenstance, a sort of a result of, of the pandemic. Probably wouldn't have happened otherwise. It's, it's interesting you say that because there's even some of those, and I know for you, I'm sure, you know, some of the more, um, shall we say, branded restaurants that you find at the front of the pad at a in a shopping center or whatever, but those experiences for us have been better just because they're carry out. Because if the food isn't terrible, you enjoy that because you don't come away going, the service was terrible. It over, you know, it overshadowed my burger or my onion rings because I couldn't get my soda refilled or my water glass, or they didn't clear, you know, dishes off the table. I just enjoyed what the restaurant had to offer and in a lot of instances, what was the negative was the lack of service. And I, but I don't think that takeout is a fair way to judge a place. And I was really, and all the critics were hands off with the you know, reviewing places for almost two years. You can't really review a place. You can't really assess what a place is like or capable of 
when you're getting takeout. I mean, and the other problem is all the containers, all the waste. <laughs> you know, we did, uh, Alinea had their 15th anniversary. And so my kids were home. Uh, my daughter graduated college during the pandemic. And for a gift, we did the Alinea takeout to, uh, dinner. And you kind of, you know, did some of the plating and finishing yourself. But man, there was like 30 little containers of things. And, you know, it's just hard to judge a place based on takeout. And invariably, you know, anything fried suffers after five or six minutes. Steaming, it's in a car, it's just yes. not the same. And so I really had a hard time. You know, I didn't want to be critical. You know, you want to be fair to these guys. But at the same time, I rarely ordered stuff that just didn't travel well. Pizza tends to reheat pretty well. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a local place. We're out in the Northwest suburbs and we love the Mexican food. But just to your point, you put fresh chips in the container, close the container, and the heat from the food renders your chips basically yeah. paper, wet paper. Yeah. And you can't well, you enjoy the find, chip and dip. But you did find places were innovating. And I saw places like with pizza trying to innovate with, you know, adding in steam escape and venting and the ability to, to sort of balance that. Because you're right, if it's sitting in your car, a cardboard in a box, 15, 20 minutes, it's done. But if you can vent it properly, it makes a difference. But no, it's been interesting to see that. I mean, fortunately, we're getting a little bit, we're getting away from some of the takeout. Well, and, and that's what it continued because people don't realize the amount of people who are employed in the restaurant industry and how important it is to the economy in general. Farmers are not selling food to a restaurant that's not open and it just goes on and on and on. And I think, you know, we have a couple of friends who own restaurants and their toughest has been having to raise prices and everybody just wants to blame them as ripping them off or, you know, adding a buck and a half to a plate. And you can't sit when, like you said, now you're the owner and you're busting tables and you're doing this. And one of your best customers is mad because, you know, your three egg omelet or whatever it was just went up a dollar and a half. But that's all of those things factored into that. It, it, Steve, I think do you it's see a short food cost changing, Steve. Do you see food no. costs? No, no, it's never going to go down. Um, there's so many problems in the backlog in the supply chain right now, mm -hmm. and the fact that you know a lot of the wheat in the world comes from Ukraine, and there's just a lot of um, cascading problems. You know, the shipping containers from China, um, a lot of the stuff we get, it's just it's being held up. And I don't think you're going to see any drop in prices. And I think people, like you were just saying, it's painful now to see your omelet get, be more expensive and go up by 20%. But there'll be a period of adjustment. And then all of a sudden, a year from now, let's talk and see how people feel about it. Because I think people are going to just get used to it. You know, yeah. there used to be a sticker shop for $30 entrees. I mean, those are like two years ago. I mean, now I'm seeing $40 entrees some, in some cases. And you know, don't even try to get a steak for less than 60, 70 bucks. No, that's, so you were, um, we switched gears a little bit here, part of the TV wars. We've had a lot of different people who were, you know, in TV from Gene Greco to Diane Burns to people and, and talk a little bit about sometimes them and, you know, what it's like to be on TV and how long you last at a certain station and why you're at the next one, uh, if you so choose or if they don't want you there or how some of that stuff works out. Well, we never get a choice in the matter. And when I sat down every two years with my news director at ABC7, you know, she would say, so well, we're thinking about moving you to this time slot or we're going to change this around. And I would just have the same response. I am here to serve at your pleasure. You know, I, you hired me. Um, I guess I have a contract. I'm not going to dictate the terms. I remember that I always heard like Jerry Taft, you know, rest in peace. Um, was always just sort of happy to have the job and just sort of took whatever they offered him. They thought, you know, he thought that was fair and he was just happy to be doing what he loved to do and get paid for it. I kind of felt the same way. I mean, there aren't a lot of people covering food in Chicago, frankly, anywhere in the country. And so I just, every, every two years, I would just say, great, fine. That sounds great. <laughs> um, but when February or January of 2021 rolled around, they wanted to go in a different direction. And I didn't really have a choice in the matter. And so I said, you know, maybe this is a good sign. I've been there for 17 years. I, it's a sign to me to go do something else. Try to figure, because I know, you know local television news, I, I, I didn't see having a, a great long horizon. We were cable, cable uh, cutters ourselves. We cut the cord here and um, <laughs> started doing my own thing, trying to build my own consulting business, 
making my own content for my YouTube channel, kind of spinning my wheels. And then out of the blue that summer, NBC had a new general manager. And like a lot of times, it really depends on who is running the shop. If they believe in sports, health, business, whatever, that beat, they're going to find somebody to fill it. And Kevin Cross, to his credit, our general manager, who used to work at CLTV, by the way, where I worked when I first moved to Chicago 30 years ago, um, he believed in food coverage, you know, and maybe his predecessor didn't because they didn't really have anybody. And so his first priority was go out and get a food person. And that's what they reached out to me. And so I said, oh, man, I'd love to because, you know, I missed it and I felt like I could, I could reinvent myself. And the other cool thing was during the pandemic was I really went back to my roots and that, you know, I shooting and editing my own material because they wouldn't give you a camera person to go in the car with you because of COVID. They wouldn't give you an editor to work together so closely. So I really had to go back to my roots and kind of figure it out, which I could do. And I really kind of like it now. I really have more creative control, schedules on my own. I, dict- I, mean, I don't go to the station that often. I'm there once a week, right, to do my segment on Thursday nights. But um, there has been a lot of turnover. I think COVID forced the hand of a lot of people. Listen, the, the ratings have been dropping steadily every year as long as I've been in this market, uh, which is 30 years. And um, the news directors and the station managers have to figure something out. What are they going to do to stem the tide? And so some of it is social media. Some of it is digital. Some of it is um, uh, they do ad placements, not for news, for non-news programming. I call them advertorial. Uh, Windy City Live used to do that a lot. So it's, it's tricky. I think the thing that I've learned is, boy, you've got to be resourceful. You've got to be um, self-sufficient. You can't rely, like people who just anchor the news, there's a lot of people who can do that. I think you've got to be able to report and anchor and shoot and edit and be multidimensional. And um, I kind of like that challenge. You've always been very innovative. And I think now with going back, you're at, I'm being on five now, all those years you were on seven, was it always about the ratings too with you, you think? Meaning, you know, they kept renewing you, renewing you. And then when COVID hits, you know, things get a little different for all of us. Yeah, I think they might have gotten a little scared, a little panicky potentially. Um, I think that um, COVID scared everybody. Uh, you know, we never, I never looked at the ratings per se so religiously. I know that's what news directors and station managers do because that sets their ad rates. I never cared so much about it. I never did anything for ratings. I did something because I wanted to do it. Um, I never looked at the overnights. Um, you know, once in a while I looked at it, but it didn't drive my decision making. And you know, I've heard from our sources that our ratings are up 35% on Thursday nights versus the rest of the week because people are tuning in to watch food. I mean, it makes sense. Chicago, you know, Chicagoans love to eat. So, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I, I think that ratings might have been a part of it. They might have, might have forced their hand. Um, but, you know, the other problem was, remember, I used to be on Friday nights at 10 o'clock. So James Ward was before me mm-hmm. every Friday at 10, chow chow for now. And then I came along in 03, and then I got the 10 o'clock a couple of years later. And so Friday night at 10, which I never agreed with as the best time, I thought Thursday at 10 made more sense. And then they had me on Saturday at 10, but then they sort of got me off of Friday night. And then they had me on tape on Saturday, and then it was on 11 a.m. on Friday. And I just felt like I just kept kind of getting diluted. Mm-hmm. And when I went over to five, they were like, when do you want to be on? What makes sense? And I said, Thursday at 10 o'clock. That's when people are planning the weekend. He said, fine, done. That's so, it. I mean, just letting me have that kind of control is just the other really amazing thing I thought about five was two weeks after I got there, they were really concerned. They didn't have a promo made yet. We had got to get a 30 second promo about the segment, the food guy, you know, it's going to run. It, it runs all the time. It runs during SNL and Sunday football. And my brother-in-law said it was on before Meet the Press the other morning. So I love that they're promoting the segment a lot. I never really found that much support. I mean, they never produced a, a segment or a promo while I was at, at seven for 17 years. But it just makes too much sense that whole Friday Eve, that if you're on Saturday at 1030, the weekend's over already and the plans right. have been made and then you forget, oh, what did he say? And then another week comes. And, and so your value right. within right. the framework of, of somebody planning a weekend obviously is uh, is diminished there. So well, I'm glad I really found that. And I really... And I really started pushing it on social media beginning Thursday morning. Um, and then they fortunately not only run my piece live Thursday night, but they rerun it Friday at 4 p.m. and they rerun it Sunday morning. And so it airs a couple of times. You know, social media is a big push as well. 
Um, so yes, yeah, so there's a sort of this cascade, this sort of wave into the weekend. So you had mentioned earlier with regards to the celebration dinner with your daughter graduating. Do you find that they, your children at their age help you keep in touch or challenge you from a social media standpoint or, you know, just go dad out of touch or whatever. Have they been a benefit for you? They're good sounding boards, definitely, because they're 21 and 24. So I do ask them about that. Um, it's so funny you mentioned that because just earlier today, I was sending a note. My daughter lives in Amsterdam and we're going there in a couple of days to see her. And um, I said, you know, Madeline, I know you know that I'm not a big TikToker, even though I feel like I need to be in that space. And I said, I just noticed that, you know, I've probably posted two dozen videos and the most views I've ever had is about 1,700. And for some reason, so every Monday in May, I'm doing a different Asian dish and country. And so this past Monday, I did dim sum from China. And I went to a place in Chinatown and was talking about three of the must have items. I've already got 10, almost 11,000 views. And I asked my daughter, like, can you give me some feedback? What do you think it is? Am I tagging properly? Is it the subject matter, the length? You know, what do you think the key is? Suddenly I have a lot, a lot more followers and a lot more views. I mean, really, um, dramatically different. So I do ask them for, for feedback and help because you got to be in that space and you cannot just say, I'm going to produce my TV story and that's my, that's my job and I'm done. And you really got to be in social media too. Well, and we're still trying to find that sweet spot yeah, because it's funny because I was at work today and I told somebody that, uh, you know, we're doing a podcast and, and with you and they're like, okay, get us the link when, when you get it up. But the first expression was you do what? And you have a YouTube channel, you know, kind of like that at your age. And it's like, like John's kids are in their late twenties, early thirties and mine are late twenties. So once we got over taking the abuse of trying to get into the social media on a platform that our kids were giving us, they're like, yeah, we'll, we'll try to help you and support you and try to keep you relevant in those ways. And ours has been more around, we do this for 45 minutes or, or whatever, and we have right. really have a good time, but how to chop it up because nobody has 45 minutes that they're going to designate to watch. Now, if we get on, you know, iTunes or on a Spotify platform, maybe somebody listens to you while they're in their car on the way to work and the traffic doesn't seem as bad because they're listening in that space. But I'm sure you even see how people consume now and you're just amazed at when you were growing up in Minnesota or going to school in Madison. Right. And now you're like, you know, I was at Johnny's Ice House on uh, Madison one afternoon. My son was coaching and I'm watching the Bears on my phone. And I remember watching the Bears on a little black and white television <laughs> from South Bend because they didn't sell out and they couldn't watch a game. Right. Amazing how that's right. changed. I mean, I remember when movies were a buck. That's how old I am. But I I'm a dinosaur. I get the New York Times delivered every day. I remember the late Tim Russert always talked about how it's important to get a newspaper because it gives you a peripheral view of the world, a sort of a capsule every day. You know, online, the problem is you only go to what interests you. Mm -hmm. So someone like me could only do maybe food and Chicago news, and then I'm missing what else is going on. And so at least with the newspaper, you can sort of glance and scan the headlines and get kind of a sense of what's going on in the world. And so I tell young people, I teach a class at Medill, um, in the summertime for the grad students, um, intro to food journalism. And I tell them, you know, you gotta get the newspaper, whether it's the journal or the times, you gotta get something every day to really know what's going on. And it's just sort of seeing art layout and how they, you know, what stories they decide that should be above the fold. And I mean, I still think that's important, even though papers are suffering, although the New York Times is not suffering, their subscriptions have gone way up during COVID. Um, but, you know, more people yet are consuming on their phones because the phones are getting faster and better and more vivid. And, you know, I'm shooting Instagram videos now on my phone exclusively, you know, a couple times a month. So, yeah, you have to be kind of everywhere. And I'm, it, I think there's no shame, you guys, in trying stuff out. Like, you know, you do video for a while and the podcast maybe that doesn't work. Like I'm trying, I have a pizza podcast every other Friday and I'm limiting it to 25 minutes because mm -hmm. it's no video, it's just audio. Because I feel like 25 minutes about the average commute, that's enough. If I go any more than that, I just, I'm not Joe Rogan. I can't do two hours. You know, I just, I really want to keep it concise and succinct. And I'm really all about editing my material. I don't want it to, to lag and, and be boring. You, no, you're okay. still doing that podcast once a week, Steve? No, every other Friday. Pizza City every, every other, Friday. other Friday. Yep. 
All right. So you bring up one point. I got one more because we got to keep it concise and then I'll turn it over to John because John always gets the last question. You made the comment about the newspaper and I still get it on my iPad. But the, the funniest part is, and you can relate to this, we probably all can, come Sunday, I feel so bad. Because normally Sunday, right, your wife comes down, she has her coffee, and you just start passing each other the sections of the paper. And now I sit with the iPad, and it's like you cut that other person out because I can't go, hey, look at this, you know, scan through this. And you probably got me now. I'm going to have to call the Daily Herald and ask them if I can just get the Sunday paper delivered. They walk the dog down the driveway to get the paper to have that little bit of Americana and homespun that we've been missing for the last couple of years. And it's cool that you realize there, there's a tradition there that's not being met, right? And so right. you need to carry on that tradition. That means a lot to you. To younger people, it doesn't mean anything unless their parents did it to them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm hoping my daughter, she has a, a digital subscription to the Times, but I'm hoping that she you know, has that tradition because you're right. It's, it's you're engaging with someone else, you're trading sections, um, you're sharing sort of uh, something that's tangible. That's exactly right. Hey, John, you get the last question. Well, you know what, uh, Mark, I'm going to do it a little differently tonight, but I'm going to put all three of us on the spot. I hope Steve wants to answer it, but I'll put all three of us on the spot. Uh, guys, uh, <laughs> Steve, I'll start with you if you can answer it. What's your top five pizzerias in Illinois? Ooh, top five in Illinois. I'm going to give go you my Robert. top five and Mark's I'm going to go with Robert's. Five. Robert's Pizza and Dill Company in Streeterville for the best three-day artisan pizza. I'm going to go with uh, Millie's Pizza in the Pan up on Argyle and Uptown for a deep pan pizza in the style of a Pequod's or Burt's. I'm going to go with Pat's Pizza on the north side for a fantastic tavern-style pin. I'm going to go with uh, Pizza, Fried Chicken, Ice Cream in Bridgeport for an equally impressive tavern-style thin pizza that very few people know about. And I'm going to go with uh, Pizza Friendly Pizza in Ukrainian Village for an out of this world Sicilian slice that you've never had. Boom. You got it. Mark, you're next. Top no, five. you're next because I'm going to turn the tables. I had a question I didn't get to All ask. Right. All right, Steve, here's my top five Giuseppe's in Des Plaines, run by the Dema family. Fantastic pizza. If you ever get out to Des Plaines, Mama Maria's in Bensonville, Unreal, uh, Italian Pizza Kitchen in Roselle, Panino's out in Park Ridge and in Evanston, Bagino Rago, Brunette, Bruno Brene, and Lenny Rago. And Rosario's in Roselle are my five picks. I'd like to see you there, Mr. Delinsky. We'll buy the pizza. All right. Now, all those all those pizza places are the same style. They're all tavern style, square cut, right? Yes. And they all yeah. have a different theme to it. And all those guys. Have, and I'll even put in Alberto's up there on the northwest side, Tony Troiano. Although Panino's does different styles, I should point out. Panino's does a, like a grandma style as well as a different style. Anyway, yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. Here's my question, which we should have asked earlier, John, for a, a food aficionado. You get to have dinner with any three people you want. Okay. Probably, uh, I would say Ted Koppel, because he's a, one of my uh, journalism idols. Uh, Nigella Lawson in London, because she is sort of a, a sort of a British version of Julia Child to me, and that she's really... Um, set kind of a new standard for, for broadcast and for food coverage. Um, and um, I think I'd have to throw a president in there. Maybe JFK. Probably JFK would have been fascinating. All right. He's, he, he left with JFK because that would have led me right to uh, Frank Sinatra and possibly Marilyn Monroe. Yeah. Okay. okay sounds good. And mine's Tony Esposito, Jim Tomey, and Steve Dolinsky. Steve's picking up the bill. <laughs> Thank you very much I for make, your time, Steve. I make less than both those guys by a long shot. Steve, thank you for coming on Angles and Attitudes. This was great. I hope you want to come back again. Thank you, guys. Have a good week. Thank, thank you. Thank you.